Okay, now we talk about the uh, uh, talk about the LP space. So we're going to we're going to show that the LP space, which is a set of functions that have finite LP norm, uh, and this space is a metric space. Okay, first of all, we're going to uh, identify two functions f and g if they are equal almost everywhere. So in this case, we just treat them as uh, the same function. Um, G. So suppose we have two functions that are in ILP, and uh, we identify them if they are equal almost everywhere on E. Okay. And then we're going to um, <coughs> define a metric on this uh, space. So the matrix is to use is to use the notation D here. So suppose we define a metric, this D, which is to, for any uh, two elements in this space is going to return a real number. Okay, and we define this to be it's actually the difference or distance between f and g using the p norm of f minus g. Okay, so for any so that means for any f and g, we're going to define this to be the difference. Between the two, so this D, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's a metric. Then it has to be a mapping for a pair of uh, elements in the space, and it is going to return a real number. So we're going to show that this is a metric, meaning that we need to show that this uh, D is sorry, it's a uh, negative definite, or I should, I should say it's positive definite in the sense that for any f and g. This value is going to be greater than equal to zero, and uh, the distance equal to zero if and only if f and g are equal. In the sense, in this sense, okay. And that's the first one. The second one is we need to check. So that's the first one. And we just check that f, the distance between f and g, is always greater than equal to zero, and uh, the distance between them is equal to zero if and only if. If and only if that f is equal to g. Okay, and that means they are equal almost everywhere. So that's uh, the first one we're going to check. Second one is uh, it is a symmetric, the distance or the difference between the two, between f and g, is the same as the difference between g and f. And the third one, which is often the most important one right here, is that, or the most difficult one to check, is that the uh, triangle inequality, which means that for any f, g, and h, uh, we need to have this, h, g. Okay, we need to show that these three are true for any functions f, g, and h, in our p-space. Okay, um, <clears throat> so it's pretty easy to show the previous, the first two, because the definition here, right? And uh, it is equal to zero if and only if f and g are equal almost everywhere. everywhere. Uh, this is because when they are equal to zero, then we have this bar p. This equal to zero, and that's just if this is equal to zero, means that this one is equal to zero almost everywhere in E. And that also means that f equals to g almost everywhere. And uh, it is also obvious that they're symmetric. The distance is symmetric. And also the triangle inequality is due to the Minkowski, Minkowski inequality we showed last time. Okay, This is because that f minus g, p norm of that, is shown to be less than equal to the f minus h, p norm. 
plus the pin of h minus g. Okay, this is by Minkowski. Equality. Okay, <clears throat> so this shows that this is actually a metric space. Uh, this LP space is actually a metric space with a metric defined in this way. Okay, and there are several questions related to that. For example, um, um, let me first uh, write down the conclusion I just made. The definition says that the for any p between one and the positive infinity, and uh, the distance is defined to be the p norm of f minus g. Then our p e with this d is a metric space. Okay, so we're going to show a few uh, important properties of uh, the LP spaces. Uh, the first one is the most simple one, uh, which says that if you have um, fk minus f, the p norm of this goes to zero. As k goes to infinity, then the norm of fk goes to the norm of f. Okay, and this is really easy to show uh, using the triangle inequality. Because we just know that the f, the p norm of f k minus the p norm of f, we take the difference of these two. It's going to be less than or equal to the f k minus f uh, p norm. Right. This is by triangle inequality, <coughs> or the uh, Minkowski inequality. We have this, and uh, this goes to zero. Means that the left hand side goes to zero. And that also means the norm goes to that. So this is a weaker, this is a weaker than that. This is a basically means that x, f, f k convert to f, and this only means that the norm or the size or the length of f k converts to the length of f. Okay? This are this is definitely are is weaker, but it's uh, a very easy conclusion can make. Um, the next one is important. We're going to show that the LP space is complete. Okay, this is really important. It's complete. So first, to recall what is uh, what do we mean by a complete uh, metric space? It means that any uh, Cauchy sequence is convergent, and uh, it, they convert to some point in the space. Okay, so this complete means that uh, if we have F K Cauchy in uh, Lp, then there exists some f in Lp such that the fk convert to f. Okay, so that's that what that's what we mean by a complete metric space. Okay, so we're going to show this. Uh, so we first consider the case where p is finite. Okay, so in this case, we first know that uh, suppose this we have a uh, Cauchy sequence. Which is a sequence in Lp. It's Cauchy. Then that means the fk minus fj it go to the p norm of this goes to zero as k and j goes to past infinity, right? So we know this. And um, let's denote the common notation we had earlier. For any epsilon, we denote the uh, the set E K J 
epsilon to be the set of points where uh, so I can use this notation to be more precise uh, precise then uh, this is a notation or for simplicity we often just write it as this okay so let's denote this well uh, if we can show that for any epsilon this set goes to the measure of this set goes to zero as k and j goes to infinity then we can show that this sequence fk converges in measure or uh, is Cauchy in measure right that's the definition of Cauchy in measure and let's see, see if that's the case so on the one hand we know that the fk minus fj let's use the p norm we know that this is going to convert to zero right this is because the sequence is Cauchy uh, it's a Cauchy sequence in the LP space on the other hand we know this is bigger than equal to this is a common trick we use uh, this is bigger than equal to if we take the measure I take the integral only on this set which is a subset of E and they take the integral here and we know that this is a this is true this inequality is true because we take a non-negative integral over a smaller set so we're supposed to get a smaller value but on this set we know that this quantity here is bigger than equal to epsilon and uh, it's power p so it's bigger than equal to epsilon or epsilon to the power p times the measure so it's bigger than this e k j epsilon and uh, like that and apparently this is bigger than equal to zero well so this is uh, going to on the right hand side it goes to zero as k and j goes to infinity and on the left hand side we know that this is a fixed epsilon is fixed so that means this one goes to zero okay and this one goes to zero as we uh, said earlier this means the set of function fk set of functions fk is our sequence of functions as fk is uh, Cauchy in measure well if it is Cauchy in measure we know that they converge to some function in measure okay so we know that there exists a measurable function such that the fk converge to f in matter on e okay and this immediately, immediately tells us that there exists a subsequence of fk uh, that converge to f almost everywhere this is by Ries theorem There is a subsequence we call fkj such that the fkj convert to f almost everywhere in e okay now uh, this is a pretty common trick that we use to to show that a sequence uh, a Cauchy sequence convergent we're going to get a subsequence that converge and we want to show that uh, this subsequence will drag the entire sequence to f okay and how do we show that this is a, a new trick uh, or it's a trick that we we can use here it's uh, the Fatos lemma so what we're going to do is to show say I want to show that this one goes to zero because I want to show that fk converts to f uh, in the LP space, I want to know that the norm, uh, the norm of FK, FK minus F, should be should go to zero as K goes to infinity. Okay? Right? So we we want to show that this goes to zero as K goes to infinity. So on the one hand, we know that this is uh, equal to the limit because F is the limit of the subsequence FKJ. Okay? So I know that this integrand it should be equal to the limit as j goes to infinity i'm sure this is just equal to that 
which is the equal to the two integrands are just equal because this convert to f uh, almost everywhere. Uh, and then we use the Fatos lemma. This is going to be less than or equal to the lower limit as j goes to infinity of the integral here. Okay, so this is always true, uh, no matter what the k is, right? This is true, no matter what the k is. Now, um, we let k go to infinity. And what happens on the uh, right-hand side is that this one will go to zero. The reason is the we have a Cauchy sequence uh, in LP space. So this is a Cauchy sequence, and this is a this is a Cauchy sequence. This is just a subsequence of that. So when we when the kj goes to infinity and the k goes to infinity, we know that this one will go to zero. Okay, as k goes to infinity. And on the other hand, this is less than equal to zero. And this shows that fk minus f has the LP norm going to zero. as k goes to infinity. Okay, so this shows that fk does go to convert to f, and the only issue right now, uh, only remaining issue right now is that if this f is in RP. Well, this would be easy to show because the p norm of f is going to be less than equal to the fk minus f plus the p norm of fk by triangle inequality or by the uh, Minkowski, uh, Minkowski inequality. And we know that the each one, each of this, uh, each function in the sequence is in Rp, so that means this is a finite. For any fixed k, this is the finite. And for any fixed k, we know that this is going to be uh, bounded by some number. For k large enough, this is going to be bounded by, say, epsilon. And this is going to be a finite number uh, for that k then uh, the right-hand side together is finite. And this implies that the f is in Rp as well. So we found a, we, we, um, show, we found a function f, also, which is also in Rp, and uh, the difference between uh, the p norm of the difference goes to zero as k goes to infinity, and that means this Rp space is complete. Right? So now we showed that case uh, when the p is finite, and uh, it is similar to show that for the infinite p equal to infinity. So, okay, when p is equal to infinity, uh, what we can do is uh, again we know that the sequence. Oh, sorry. The infinity norm is going to infinity as k j going to infinity, right? So that we assume this is a Cauchy sequence there, and because of this, uh, remember that the the uh, infinity norm is the essential uh, supremum, which is defined as the. Uh, now we use this or not? So it's just the the uh, this just the, the number. Uh, say m, such that the difference of these two is less than or equal to m uh, for almost almost everywhere. Okay, so it's the essential upper bound or essential supremum. Okay, so uh, by this we know that the uh, fk will converge. The fk will be a Cauchy sequence almost everywhere for every fixed point x. Uh, we look at the numerical sequence of fk x minus fj of x, it will be a Cauchy sequence for almost every x. Okay. So fk is Cauchy almost everywhere. Okay. Or in other words, there exists a subset Z of the set E such that the measure of Z is zero and the FK X 
is Cauchy for any x outside of z or in the set E minus z. Okay, this is what we mean by that fk is Cauchy almost everywhere. Well, uh, if we know that for every for such kind of x, the sequence f k of x is Cauchy, then we know that it is a convergent sequence. So that means that they have a limit. Now let's def let's define say uh, f x to be the limit of f k of x where k goes to infinity for any x in the in the outside of z okay and if it's inside z then uh it doesn't matter what it is it could be infinity it could be anything uh, because it's, uh, the z is a measure zero set so whatever happens there uh, when we take the integral it doesn't matter okay so we just define that to be this in the ffx is arbitrary if for any x in z so this is how we're going to def how we define the, this function f and we're going to show that this f is actually the limit um, of fk and this f is also a uh, is also uh, in the space of our infinity okay so how do we to show that uh, we're going to show that for any epsilon let's look at the uh, Let's look at this. On the one hand, I know this is going to less than epsilon, less than equal to epsilon when the k is sufficiently large. Okay, so when you take the j going to infinity, then this is going to be less than epsilon for k sufficiently large. This is because we should use infinity. This is because the sequence is a Cauchy sequence in RP space. And uh, this means that this is a supremum norm, and uh, this is going to be bigger than or equal to any x in the set e minus d. Because this is an essential upper bound. And uh, this is just uh, any specific point. I'm going to restrict ourselves to uh, to this set, okay? And because we take the limit as j goes to infinity, we know that the uh, sequence f j converts to f at the point x. That's how we define this limit uh, limit function. So this is just uh, f k of x minus f of x okay it's because at the point x this converts to f of x when the x is in this uh, in this set well so now what we have concluded is that for any epsilon there exists k sufficiently large such that this is true for any k bigger than or equal to capital k Right? And for any x in e minus z, this is for any k and any e. This is because uh, this thing is not dependent on x. So this will be true. This will be bigger than or equal to this for any x over this set. Okay, so it doesn't matter what its x is. Right? We'll have that. And with this, we can show that the f k over the set e minus z this f k minus f should be uh, bound by epsilon and uh, for the for the set z because it's uh, only a major zero set so it doesn't matter what happens there so that's why this is going to be less than equal to epsilon okay and this is because that this essentially only depends on only depends on what happens over this set and this set we show that 
for any x, this number is less than or equal to this number is less than or equal to epsilon or epsilon. So that's why this is true. Okay, and we show that for k is sufficiently large, sufficiently large, this is less than epsilon, and also uh, we want to figure out if this f is also in Rp. So we know that the sequence convert to f. Uh, the only thing pending right now is that if this f is in our p in our infinity, and that is the same trick as before, uh, because the infinity norm of f is less than or equal to the infinity norm of this plus the infinity norm of f k, and uh, we know that we can make this small enough, and uh, for that k, we know that this is also finite, so everything together tells us uh, that this is a uh, less than f infinity, and this implies that f is also in R infinity. Okay, similarly, similar as, uh, as before. Okay, so the theorem have, we have concluded here is that <coughs> the RP space is actually complete. Any Cauchy sequence in RP is uh, a convergent sequence, and they convert to some function in RP. Okay, so this is a very important uh, result of of uh, RP spaces. Okay, so you know that when we work on metric spaces, we want to work on complete metric spaces because we want to derive the convergence from the Cauchy, from a Cauchy sequence. We want to show that Cauchy sequences are all convergent. Okay, now let's move on to the um, next property. We're going to show that, well, uh, Actually, a few important results are related to the LP spaces. We're going to show that LP space is uh, dense. Um, or in other words, the continuous functions are dense in LP space. And not only that, we actually can show that this, the LP space is separable. Uh, what we mean by separable is that uh, uh, the space has a countable dense subset. Okay, let me write down the definition here. We have a metric space, we call it separable if it contains a countable dense subset. Okay, uh, we know we first know what is a dense subset, right? A set a subset is called a dense in X means that for any point in X we can f and for any point in X and for any epsilon we can find so this is the X. Uh, we have a dense subset means that for any point X in the set and for any epsilon, uh, so we can draw a ball centered at X with the radius epsilon for any such ball. Uh, it doesn't matter where this x is, and no, no matter what is how small the epsilon is, there will be always some point uh, in the ball that is from the subset. In this case, we call that subset a dense subset. Okay, a typical example is the um, the rational numbers in R. Uh, we know that R is a metric space. Okay, the R is a metric space, and uh, you look at the all the rational numbers together. Uh, it will be a dense subset in the sense that for any x, no matter if it is, is it rational or irrational, we know that for any x and for any epsilon, there exists some rational number in, in there in the in the neighborhood of x. Okay, so the um, the set of rational numbers is a dense subset of R, and not only that, it is a countable dense subset. If this dense subset is also countable, uh, we call it a countable dense subset, then that is also the situation for R. Uh, the rational numbers are dense, are countable, and it's a dense in R. And uh, if the set X contains a countable dense set, and we, call it, we can call it a separable space. Okay? And in this case, you can see 
this R is a, a separable space because it contains a countable dense subset, the rational numbers. And but we are considering general metric spaces, especially, especially we're going to consider the LP space. And the D is defined to be the, the norm we are the difference, the norm of the difference between two functions. So we're going to show that is also a separable space. Okay. Uh, before that, we we'll to first give a uh, lemma. So the lemma says that if we have a finite p, which is the power, and any f in our p, then for any epsilon, the following statements hold. Okay, so the first one is that there exists a continuous function g such that the p uh, the integral of the f minus g p norm of f minus g is less than epsilon. So this is basically means that the the you know, if you you can take this piece power piece root on both sides, and then essentially just means that this is true, right? Um, well, we we actually showed the this we actually showed this for p equals to one before. We know that the for any function f, integrable function f, in that case f is in L one and this is integrable. We know that there exists a continuous function g such that with compact support. Uh, such that this f minus g is less epsilon, no matter how small the epsilon you chose at the beginning. Okay, so this is actually the same thing here. Uh, we can find a continuous function g, so continuous function g with compact support. Such that this is true. Okay, the only difference is that. We uh, instead of using p equals to one, we use the general p greater than or equal to one. Okay, so that's the only difference. Uh, so I'm not going to show this uh, because this is actually the same technique as before. Uh, the the key is that you're going to first show that there exists a simple function. So you call this simple function uh, with compact support. Such that the uh, f minus g, the integral of this, sorry, um, f minus phi, is less than say epsilon or half epsilon, uh, uh, whichever you want. Um, let's say half epsilon. Well, uh, that's for that's how we proved this case for this case, but if it's to the piece power, it's the same. Um, you know that you can find this simple function just by looking at that right, you can find the sequence that's the monotone increasing to f. Uh, suppose f is uh, non-negative, you can approach that f from below. And if f is a general function, it could be positive and negative, then you just have, you know, uh, approx approximate the f plus and f minus separately using a simple function. Okay? And you can do that, and you can make sure that f and the difference between f and the phi are, are arbitrarily small, right? The reason for doing that is you can actually partition the say uh, the range into say uh, first you have the gap as one. We have this function. You have the gap one, and you take for each set you take the um, for example for f falling into this one and two. You're going to look at, say, this set, right? And then you're going to take a, a uh, simple function like that, just like this. Uh, then you increase uh, the, you refine the, the partition, 
on this vertical uh, on this line you make this one half and then one quarter so you make this you make one quarter and uh, one over eight you know refined uh, refine this vertical the range so that you have a refined uh, uh, simple function and they will convert they are nine, nine decreasing and they're going to convert to f point wisely okay so you know that they can make this arbitrarily small uh, when you make a refine refine the gap of these two will be so it depends on the gap you have here if you have this as your gap on the vertical line then the f minus phi in this case will, will be less than equal to 1 over 2 to the k okay so you know that it is going to be less than 1 definitely it's going to be very small so if that's the small then the f minus phi to the power p is less than equal to f minus phi the reason is that this number is less than one for any x so if you take the p to the power it will be even smaller right? since p is greater than equal to one okay so if you can make this less than half epsilon then you definitely can make this less than half epsilon so that's the first step you're going to get this uh, simple function and then you're going to get so this is the compact this function has a compact support as well then you can find a continuous function g that is equal to phi, uh, almost equal to phi by the by the Luzin's uh, theorem. You can show that uh, the there exists some set uh, which it can be arbitrarily small. Let's say that there exists a set called k, and uh, the measure of k can be less than equal to or less than equal to epsilon over say four m, where m is um, m is the largest value of phi so the phi is less than equal to m okay you can choose this way and then uh, for this k you will find a continuous function g that is identical to phi outside of k so g is equal to g is continuous and uh, the g when you restrict it to e minus k is it will be equal to equal to phi so it's not that not just these, it's actually the compact support of this phi. Uh, because the G also have a also has a compact support similar to phi. So it doesn't have to be the E. It's just that you be a say if your phi is sorry, if your phi is defined over a compact support, say your phi is like that, then your G is also, you know, just uh, just within this support. It's in the finite support. So you can find a continuous function g that is identical to phi uh, over the set e outside of k. Uh, then the, within the k, uh, both of them are bounded by m, and uh, the set size of the k is pretty small. So in this case, you can use you can check this, say to the power p, and this is less than equal to f minus sorry f minus g. Should use f minus g. You want to show that this distance is small. And you can bound this distance by the f minus phi, the power p plus the uh, the phi minus g to the power p. Okay, and uh, you probably have two to the power p uh, somewhere on the right hand side, but it doesn't matter because we can always make the right hand side pretty small. So you may have say two to the power p of that, uh, but this is a constant, right? P is a fixed, so this is a constant. As long as you can. As long as you can make the, both of them small, then it will be fine. Okay, and this first term is small as we showed right here. So it can be arbitrarily small. And this term can be small as well because we know that there, uh, take the difference, you only find it will be zero over, sorry, over this set. So it can, be, will be, can only be non-zero outside of that. So this is actually equal to the integral uh, outside of, uh, inside of k. But the k is pretty small because this is less than equal to m, and the measure of k is less than equal to epsilon over four m, something like that. So this together can be uh, multiplied together is just epsilon over four. It's really small, and this is also small. So you have both of them small, and the, the right hand size is small. This is how we're going to show that, show this first property right here. Okay, and the the conclusion here is pretty clean. It just means that. The uh, continuous functions uh, are dense in in the RP space. Or actually, for any function in RP, you can find a 
continuous function with a con compact support such that this is true. Okay, for any function f in Lp, you can find a continuous function g with a compact support so that this can be smaller than epsilon. Okay, for any epsilon, you can do this. For you can find such a g. Okay, that's the first uh, uh, result in the lemma. Second one is uh, it's going to help us to show that the set uh, the space Lp is a uh, say it's a, a separable space. Okay, and to show that, so the theorem or the result says that there exists uh, a simple function phi. Uh, which is of form it's like a step function or simple function ci to ci i that's from 1 to k so it has only k different it can only take k different values ck ci uh, c1 through ck and uh, each one has a domain AI. And this AI, uh, we actually can consider the AI to be um, simple, um, simple sets in the sense that each AI is a finite union of uh, open boxes. A regular grid. So I'm going to explain what this is. Regular grid. And it has compact support. Such that f minus phi to the power p is less absolute. Okay, so I'm going to explain what this is. So we had a very clean result earlier. We showed that for any epsilon uh, and for any f in Lp, we can find some function g such that this is uh, less epsilon. But right now, I'm going to show that we can find some phi uh, that can be written in this way so that uh, this is also true. Well, we can pretty much get this uh, if it's, we do only require phi to be a simple function, right? That's what we one part of the proof we had in the in the first item. Uh, but right now I have a restriction that this AI is a finite union of open boxes uh, on regular grids. So what I mean by that is this AI can be thought of as if I draw the picture. We see that the by regular grids I mean those. Uh, are bisections. So I can have this where this is one, two, three, one, two, three. And uh, I'm going to show that the first of all, this each of this AI must be a compact support, must have a finite, um, I'll say, must have um, a compact so each of this must have a compact support that's because this f phi has a compact support the other thing is, is compact support means that it must be bounded right it has to be each ai must be bounded so how i'm going to get uh, resemble this ai i do this kind of partition of the space and uh, if the if the open box is inside the ai then we will put this uh we'll we'll keep it and then, uh, you know, if the set AI looks like this, see if the AI looks like this. Well, if this is completely inside, I'm going to keep it. If it's part of it is not, then I will just uh, leave it out. Okay. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, do a refined partition. I'm going to divide the size by two by half, all this by half. Then I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, we can show that if the box is completely inside AI, then I'm going to keep it. Okay, and then I'm going to do this um, because the partition, the boxes that I can partition here will be 
countable because I'm just using the size of one, one half, one quarter, so on and so forth. And uh, for each one of them, there are countable money uh, boxes here. So in total, we still countable. And we're going to take the union of those things and eventually get the AI. Okay. Um, and uh, we, well, you may ask that what what if we cannot really approximate this with the finite money unions? Well, you can truncate because you only need this to be less absolute. So you don't if this is really really small area that you you can just throw it away to just ignore it. But if you keep refining this, then it's supposed to have you're supposed to be able to approximate this AI um, or get a union of this uh, these boxes that with the measure uh, close to this AI as much as you want, okay? as close as you want. So uh, in that case, uh, they only, you only have a mismatch to the, the true EI, which we use to construct the, the measurable uh, the simple function to approximate the F. The, the difference between EI and the AI will be arbitrarily small okay? in that case. You can you don't really care about that because this is only give, it gives you epsilon positive epsilon that give you some uh, error tolerance, so you can just always uh, approximate in that way. Okay, so the details will be a little bit uh, tedious, uh, but the idea is you know it's just this. So uh, I guess could uh, do it try it uh, to write down the proof uh, rigorously just as a practice, and I think this uh, and you know this is also applicable to to other cases or you know uh, uh, a similar situation that we want to show that I can approximate uh, a measurable or countable uh, sorry a compact set or a, a bounded set a bounded measurable set in Rn you can approximate by finite union finite union of of these open boxes okay as long as you're given a tolerance. Uh, positive tolerance, and then you can do that. Okay, so uh, that's the that's the conclusion. Uh, the claim that we made here is that the first one is pretty clear, right? Uh, the second one here is that uh, for any epsilon, we can also approximate a function f using uh, simple functions like this, where this uh, we have only k of them, and each of these ai is a union of is a finite union of open boxes. Okay, so it means that this file can be pretty easy, simple. And by using this, we're going to show that this, this kind of file will be dense because we can show that we can approximate f by any f by certain kind of file. And if we can show that file is dense, uh, if we can show that this file is countable, uh, this kind of file is countable, then we'll be done. Uh, so there's a sl still a slight gap uh, between countable uh, b b to show that this kind of sets this kind of functions form a countable subset uh, because this CI. The CI is a real number, but uh, you can see, imagine that we can just replace this CI by some regular number. So if all my phi function phi's are like uh, some regular number times such kind of thing, then we can show that such kind of phi are uh, is countable set. It's countable set, and you can use that to approximate any function f. So that is a dense countable set countable dense subset in the R in the RP and uh, this tells us that our P space is separable okay so we're going to show that uh, a little uh, I'm going to show that uh, in the next theorem okay this is just to use to show that okay so um, that's the first the consider the case where the uh, the uh, so we're going to show that uh, P B in yeah, one with I'm going to show that our P space is separable. Okay, so this is the uh, main theorem in this section. Okay, so how do we show that? 
uh, we first assume the uh, the set is the it's just the entire R. Okay, suppose for simplicity that we consider E just the entire R. Okay, so we are going to construct a dense countable dense subset of R P, and uh, then we uh, then we can show that this R P is a separable space. Okay, how do we show that? Uh, the idea is actually came from what I just mentioned. We're going to approximate or any function using such kind of thing, where the CI I want to replace that by rational numbers. So the idea is that uh, for any epsilon, uh, there exists a simple function as we as we uh, show here, as we showed here. Right, there is a simple function phi, which can be written as a sum of C i cos C A i i is from one to k. This A i is the finite union of open boxes. Okay, such that the f minus phi, the norm of that is less than let's say half epsilon. Okay. Okay, and then we know that because this is a, um, we we found this we determine this phi first, and so the ci will be bounded, and this uh, the size of ai are also bounded. Right. Let's say that uh, they are since they are bounded, we know that there exists some m large enough, such that. The uh, all the CIs are bounded by M, and all the um, AIs has all these AIs have uh, the measure less than M to the power P for any I. Okay, so we know that since they're all finite, so we can find such an M. Okay. And then uh, for the CIs, this is where we're going to make a difference uh, compared to the uh, the lemma. We're going to choose, we're go we're going to choose a rational number ri for each CI so that the ri is really close to CI. Okay. And one the the difference between the two really small is less than epsilon over 2km. So I know I can do that since they are the rational numbers are dense in uh, in the set of real numbers. Okay. So we choose this for any again for any i. Then we're going to you know going to uh, define a modified version of the phi we call it the psi. The psi to be is uh, the same as phi, but with ci replaced with uh, the ri. Then we have you show that the difference between phi and uh, uh, psi. This is equal to because both of them are like simple functions, so it should be the first one should be C i C a i. The second one is R i C a i. Now we're going to look at the p norm. Okay, and apparently this uh, I can combine the common factors. So the coefficient of this term will be just a ci minus ri. So this is equal to sum of ci minus ri cai p norm. i is from 1 to k. And then we can apply the triangle inequality. This is less than or equal to i from 1 to p. The uh, ci minus ri can extract it out. That we need to put an absolute value of that, and then the CAI P. Okay, sorry, this is okay. Uh, 
Well, this kind of thing is just a. Uh, these things can be easily computed because let's say uh, I have a general say A. I want to check its p norm. That will be just uh, it's just this, right? And this is equal to one uh, over e uh, over set A. So the inside inside parenthesis is just the the measure of A. Right, because it's it's equal to one over a, over the set A is zero outside of A. Okay, so this is just uh, gives you one. Uh, so this to the power one over P. Okay, and then we can see that this is just less than equal to, sorry, just equal to C I minus R I, and the the measure of A I to the power one over P. Okay, so now this is where we're going to use the bound we had. We know that each of this is less than, or less than or equal to, or just less than epsilon over two k m, and each of this is less than equal to m to the power p. So in total, this will be less than sum for i from one to k epsilon over two k m times m p, but they take the p's root. So this will be canceled with this m, and you have half epsilon over k for each term, but there are k terms, so this is just equal to half epsilon. So we show that for any epsilon, uh, we can find a phi uh, that is like this, such that the difference between these two is less than half epsilon. And this is on, on the other hand, we also have that this phi can be used to approximate f, and the difference is less than half epsilon. Then we know that difference, the p norm of f minus uh, psi is going to be less than epsilon by using triangle inequality, right? So f minus psi will be less than or equal to f minus phi plus the norm of phi minus psi. And on the right hand side, both of them are less than half epsilon, so in total that will be less than epsilon. And this is how I'm going to how we show that. Um, for any epsilon, we can approximate. For any epsilon and any f in our p, we can approximate by approximate this f by uh, such kind of functions. Okay. And on the other hand, we know that what are the set of functions like this psi? So it's like these things. Okay, and Ri is from Q. The Ai is finite union of open boxes. Finite union of open boxes. So the part of this set is countable because for each one of this, this is a countable, right? And uh, this one we can form countable uh, many of such Ai's. In the so this uh, set gamma is actually countable subset of the LP and uh, we also show that for any function f we can find some psi from this set such that the difference of the two is less than epsilon so that implies as this set is a uh, <coughs> dense countable dense set, subset of LP okay so we showed the case for uh for e for e being the the uh, entire space Rn, or entire uh, Euclidean space Rn. Uh, if it's just a subset of that, uh, then we can, you know, it's just a similar, right? We just need to uh, define the function g. Okay, so if if uh, the is general, so subset of that, then for any f, we can just define the g to be f times cosi e. Okay, then this g is still defined R n. Then we can find uh, a function that has, you know, we can just approximate g using the psi, and we can show that the g minus psi will have our p norm uh, less than epsilon. And then you look at this our p norm, what that is, g minus psi the p norm. Uh, this is just a uh, 
equal to this because um, well, first of all, this psi is going to be um, less than or equal to g. If g is non-negative, the psi is less than or equal to g. Uh, if otherwise, you can approximate g plus g minus separately, and then you're going to show that you can easily show that this is true, right? Because outside of e, uh, both of them will be zero. Sorry, p norm, p power, p power. Okay, outside of that is uh, equal to zero. And then uh, the f is just equal to g over the set e. So this is just equal to the integral of f minus psi to the power p. Okay, and now on the one hand, I know that, uh, sorry, this can be less than epsilon. As we showed in the first uh, uh, before, if the set is general, RN, you can show that there exists such a file that such that this one is less than epsilon. But this is essentially just equal to that. Okay, so that's how we show that. This is also true for general uh, measurable set E. Okay, it doesn't have to be the, the entire RN. Okay, so that's the major theorem. We're going to we show this uh, for this subsection. So in conclusion, what we have shown so far is that the RP spaces are complete metric spaces where the metric is defined as the, the, the RP norm of the difference between the two functions. And also such spaces are separable. Okay? Uh, for, for P less than, P final P, this RP is a separable space. Okay, so now let's look at uh, one more uh, example. So, Let's say that the uh, p is between 1 and positive infinity, and f is rp. We're going to show that the limit this integral, which is f of x minus f of x minus t to the power p as t goes to infinity. So the, the norm of t goes to infinity. Well, here the, the x is a vector because, because it's in Rn. The t is also the same vector, uh, a vector of the same dimension as x. So they're all n-dimensional vectors. So that's why I have to say that this is a norm of t or the length of t. So I'm going to show that this is going to be equal to zero. The limit of this goes to zero. Oh, sorry, it goes to, let's see, it's going to be two times the, this. Okay, so what this means, uh, so basically you have a function f in Rp, that means that, uh, well, within the compact support, uh, the the outside of compact support, this f, the integral of f will be arbitrarily small, right? Or in other words, there for any epsilon, there exists a compact support such that outside of the support, the integral of f has is uh, less than the epsilon. Okay, and then you this means that you basically shift this function. You shift this function, it'll be plus or minus doesn't matter. You shift this function. Uh, by t, so it's like that. You basically have a function like this, uh, and then this is in Rp, and you shift it by to another place by t. So shift it by t, and for t larger and larger, then you basically can you know these two don't really have much overlap, and then you take the integral. Of the sum of the two, it basically gives you two times the integral of this one only. Okay, it's like that. Okay, so let's sh let's show why this is true. Okay, so the idea is that um, let's first look at this. We're going to define. Let's first let's say this for any epsilon. We're going to show that. 
uh, the difference of this minus this is going to be less than epsilon for t large enough. Right? This is what we're going to show. Well, to show that, let's first show that for any epsilon. Um, let's do a decomposition of f. At f equals to g plus h be the decomposition. Since this, uh, the decomposition is done in the following way, because the set of continuous functions are uh, dense in Rp, so this g, where this g is continuous with compact support, such that the uh, f minus g to the power p is less than uh, half or quarter of epsilon. Okay, let's let it be that strong. Okay, I want the p norm of that. Okay, so this is actually just the, the p norm of f minus g. It, there exists a continuous function such that uh, with compact support, this is g here, such that f minus g, uh, the p norm of that is less than f, uh, epsilon over 4. Okay, so that's by the dense. Uh, but the fact that the, the continuous functions are dense in RP, and that's one thing, and the this will be our H, okay, this will be our H. So we just showed that, so there is decompose this F into two functions, where this G is continuous function with a compact support, and this H has a norm, uh, P norm less than half, a uh, quarter of epsilon. Okay, so, and with that, we can show the following, um, let's say that we define or denote. Let me just, uh, let me just write it directly. Let me look at this G. Let's define it either, either. So find a T. Uh, denote denote the uh, F of F T of X to be the F of X minus T. Okay, for any fixed t, we can denote that. And similarly, we're going to define the gt to be f of x, uh, g of x minus t. And uh, we're going to do the same for h, but the, say the h of t is the h of x minus t. So let's say we're going to denote this. And then we look at, uh, first thing we're going to look at is this g, because the g will have compact support, so we don't really have any overlap like this one. Uh, because it has a compact support, so it's like something like this, okay. And then when we shift the t and uh, we shift it large enough, then these two do not have any overlap. So this is why we need this g. We want it. We want the the compact support for g, and so that we can completely separate them. So we know that for for t sufficiently large or for t large enough, we know that the, you look at these two functions, uh, you shift the t, uh, shift the t, very large t, you look at the two functions, they don't, really have, don't have any overlap, so you look at the integral here, the g of x plus g uh, t of x, the bar p, so this is like the gx, this is like a gt of x, you shifted it so much, so so far away, so uh, this is essentially just equal to, but they don't have, their support do not overlap, so just like on one part, this, you only have the gx, so that's, the gt will be equal to zero, and on the other hand, you will have the gtx to the power p, okay? But you know that you shift this, you shifted this, uh, they will have the same RP norm as this one. So we will get just uh, two times the GXP. Okay, so that's uh, the, so now we prepared everything we need to show the limit. So remember the limit is to show that this F plus FT, the P norm, I'm going to show that this is a. Only you want to show that the p norm. F 
is the f plus f t p p to the power p is equal to two times, or is converging to two times the f p p. Now we take the piece root on both sides. I'm going to show that this minus two to the power one over p times f p. We're going to show this is less epsilon. Okay, that will be sufficient. Since we can just take the p's power on both sides, or on these two terms, we'll get the, the desired limit. Okay, we'll just look at this. So by first by triangle inequality, this is less than equal to f plus f t p norm minus one g p norm plus the g. Well, we have the constant, so just keep it. It's two to the power one over p g p minus two to the power one over p, and then p norm of f. Okay, simple triangle inequality between numbers. All right, so now this first term, as we just showed, this is the uh, this is the p the p norm of g, and it appears to be uh, related to that, right? So you take the p root of both sides. This term, we take the p root, will be this term. So that means this one, if we take the p root, which will be just the p norm of g plus g t, that will be the same as this term. Okay, so that's why this is the f plus f t p minus g plus g t p. That's for the first term. Second term, uh, well, we can extract this constant. Now we have the g p minus f p. Okay, the first term we can definitely apply the triangle inequality. This becomes just a f plus f p t minus uh, g plus g t p norm. And the second one is just uh, g minus uh, f p norm. And then we have the constant right here. Okay, and this first one is just going to give us the h plus h t. Right? To the p norm. And the second one gives us this. g minus g, g minus f, which is also the, h, the p norm of h. The p norm of h. Since f equals to g plus h. Okay, and then by triangle inequality, this is less than equal to the p norm of that plus the uh, p norm of, of hp plus this constant time the p norm of h. But remember that each one of them is less than a uh, quarter of epsilon. So it's just less than this plus that times epsilon over 4. Okay. Uh, this will be less than 2 because p is greater than or equal to 1. So this is less than 2. So altogether, this will be going to be less than epsilon. And that is how we show that this, uh, for t large enough, this will be less than epsilon. Okay, and that shows the limit right here.